Good morning. Last week, I talked about elementals. If you didn't hear that talk, you can still access it on our YouTube site. Uh, I think it's called White Mountain World YouTube, something like that, right? OK, anyway, uh, a co-worker sent me an email yesterday uh, a, about a story that she found in the New York Times. And I wanted to share it with you just to further substantiate my talk last week on elementals. So I'm going to read it a little bit of what the Times said. And I don't know if you can see this up on the screen or not. Maybe the video camera could zero in on it. It says, beware of elf. <laughs> Are you getting it? OK. This is the story. When this person, I cannot possibly pronounce his name. It's like S-I-G-L-U-F-J-O-R-D-U-R. -R. It's his name, this, let's say this young man. When this young man, no, actually it's not a man, it's a place. OK. When, <laughs> when uh, this town, a small mountain town in northern Iceland was hit by a series of storms last summer, Construction workers clearing a roadway soon found themselves dodging mudslides and contending with a flooded river. A crew member was injured. Then a bulldozer broke down. A TV reporter who arrived to survey the damage sank into a mud pit and had to be rescued. Clearing the debris stretched into a 10-day ordeal and became a spectacle. The culprit, locals knew, had been heavy rainfall or elves. It turns out that construction workers had unwittingly dumped dirt on a rock that is special enough to have its own name in Icelandic folklore. Alf Connerstein. <laughs> That's the name of the rock. The rock even has a backstory that involves a human, a fairy, and an enchanted elf cloth. Icelandic elves, also called hidden people, or alfar, are not tiny, pointy-eared creatures. Alda, who has another strange long name, <laughs> a journalist and the author of The Little Book of the Hidden People, said in an email, they are thought to be regal and human-like. And a good way to think of them, this author wrote, is as the Icelanders' version of karma. Elves have been blamed for wrecking havoc on construction projects across Iceland for decades. I think I'll stop there, but isn't that fun? Yeah, I was, I was thrilled. The timing couldn't have been better. OK, so moving on. <laughs> this morning, I'm talking about a light bearer and the wisdom teachings. To be a light bearer is to make a commitment to bring light into the darkness through your talents, your service, your love, the will to good and dedication to serve even the greater good. Now, if you are a light bearer, 
then you are going to bring one who brings the teaching into the world. The teaching is a formulation of light. It's an important point to remember that the teaching is the formulation of light. So a light bearer is a disciple of the light. A disciple of the spiritual hierarchy of this planet. So there's your definition right there of you know who is a light bearer and what their job is and who they work for. So if you remove religion and ideology and philosophy out of the equation and just simplify it. To say a light bearer is a disciple of the light, then it removes negativity, it removes opinions, it removes uh, the history of organizations and churches and so forth, you know, from that person or from that group or from that nation. It just helps us to understand uh, what a light bearer is or who a light bearer is. And that light bearer can be uh, a person who works behind the scenes and, in fact, usually is. Uh, every once in a while, we're going to find light bearers that become uh, publicly known because of their work, not because of their money or their station in life or um, if they're blue collar or white collar worker, uh, you know, all the above. It's by their service. So we can think of over history uh, light bearers that were not related to religion at all. And then we can think of light bearers that were related in some way, you know, to religion or a spiritual path. I'm not going to name those names because you know who they are. But the point is to understand that a light bearer is a disciple of the light. And that the light is a form, or the teaching is a formulation of that light. Okay, the teaching is a formulation of that light. So, Oftentimes, I hear people uh, tell me about a book that they've read. Wow, this sounds just like the teaching. And they are so surprised. Why? Why are we surprised? Hey, if the teaching is a formulation of light, and a light bearer is a disciple of the light, then why can't a light bearer create a book, write a book, uh, a movie, uh, a poem, painting, and so forth, that is not identified with a religion or a country. It's just pure light, pure teaching. So that's the point I wanted to start off with this morning is to remove all of the opinions and organizations and so forth uh, that people try to define a light bearer as. And then to move it over a little bit and to say a disciple is a light bearer. Okay? So you can find a disciple anywhere in the world that does not necessarily have to be identified with a religion. The esoteric teaching on discipleship today is concentrated on the specialized teaching of Agni Yoga, the Tibetan Joel Kul, and Helena Blavatsky, and others. But this is the core of the teaching as we are studying it today, particularly for us 
uh, Agni Yoga. Uh, for many people, they're studying the books of Alice Bailey, and even before that, uh, and they continue on today, they're studying theosophy, but specifically the teachings of Helena Blavatsky. And then we have the disciples, you know, of Agni Yoga. See the disciples? Remember what a disciple is? A bearer of light, right? That are promulgating, continuing uh, the tradition of these teachings, the wisdom of these teachings in today's society. And we will see, for example, we know Torquem Saradarian was a light bearer who represented the spiritual hierarchy of this planet, who represented the teaching and brought them forward into modern life, even modern language. A disciple, we could say, is one who is becoming self-realized. A light bearer is one who is becoming self-realized. They have heard the inner call of the capital S self. And in responding to that call, they begin to strive how? They begin to strive beyond the ordinary life. Beyond the ordinary life. The self, capital S self, is the divinity within each of us. It is the creative center within each of us. So each of us has this divine center, this center of life and light that apparently lies dormant until there a certain moment occurs in our life where that flame, let's call it, is ignited. When that flame is ignited, it is understood as a call. And that call comes specifically to you. And if you respond to that call, then you move beyond the ordinary life. See, your life takes on a completely different significance. You begin to walk a path that the ordinary person does not walk and most likely will not understand. You can take uh, the saint Mother Teresa and ask, why would anybody live a life like she did? Her life represents to us one who is no longer an ordinary citizen of this planet. She moved beyond the ordinary life. And there are many people in the world today, more people like that in the world today than back in the early 1900s. Because we're advancing as a humanity, and because we are advancing as a humanity, we need more light bearers to reveal truth, to reveal wisdom, to help us understand the purpose of life. So that self is the divinity within each of us. And it is what we call a center. And this center is a center or source of what? It's a source of light. It's a source of love. It's a source of power. So a person who is in contact with this inner center brings their creativity to the world. Through a vision, they bring this creativity to the world through a vision which inflames others with what? New direction. Now, here's another term. 
Chila, C-H-E-L-A. Chila is an esoteric term for a light bearer. A chila learns how not to lose themselves in different situations, different emotions, reactions, and difficulties, even successes and failures. This chila, this light bearer, learns how not to lose their life purpose, how to lose, not to lose their solemnity, uh, how not to lose where they are on that path that will help give direction to others. They've learned how to stand steady at the helm. They eventually, over time, learn that all of these situations, from the most difficult to the most positive, is the process of, and it is a process, of illumination a process of enlightenment which they, in which they eventually find their true self. So this, again, this true self, capitalist self, this goes into a whole new realm of teaching to understand what this capitalist self is. But we can have an idea in this way that when we contact our inner divinity, this capitalist self, we then become the future. See, that future is an archetype of our soul. That soul is part of the self. When we respond to the call, after that soul is ignited or that flame is ignited, then we have almost a direct line to this capital S self, which puts us in contact, and this is why we no longer live the ordinary life, puts us in contact with divine beings in the other worlds, like this planetary logos, the solar logos, hierarchy, uh, the great masters of hierarchy, disciples, senior disciples, initiates. It places your consciousness in that realm where you can be inspired. But you undergo training. We undergo training for many lifetimes until we reach that point where now all that we've been trained to do Which, which represents the degree of our enlightenment, how much of a light bearer we are. What I'm trying to say here is that if you have been trained for two or three lifetimes, and in that process you become successful, and your light is increasing, then that is the light you bring with you into humanity or the formulation of the teaching that you bring in through your creativity and your life purpose. Is that clear? Oh, good. Okay. So it is in finding our true self that the chila finds the self in others. See, the chila is no longer distracted by our stupidity. Uh, our stupid little selves, our ego, our vanity, our sense of self-importance, how much money we have, how poor we are, and so forth. It's the chila that recognizes the self in others and then challenges that person to recognize who they are, where that center is, that divine self that is there but likely buried. Achila then is one who is in the process of becoming one with their innermost core or self. 
at a certain stage, they become recognized by their humanitarian nature and creative endeavors. It's like I was watching Bill Maher the other night, and they always have a special person, you know, at the beginning of the program uh, that typically is remarkable. A couple of them have not been. They've been disgusting. But, <laughs> the, <laughs> but this particular person is an actor. His name is Sean Penn. And I'm sure you all know of Sean Penn. And Bill Maher said, you know, there's something odd about you. <laughs> and Sean Penn said, what is that? And he said, you go toward problems. You go toward all these countries that are suffering and that are in war and whose citizens are in dire straits and need help. Where everybody else runs away from them, you run toward them. See, that's an example of a light bearer. He brings light into the darkness. You are a light bearer, a chila, if you are close to your true self. If you have, let's say, 5% of light, 5% of that self is now manifesting through you and all that you do, that is the level of your discipleship. No matter who you tell people you are, no matter what position you hold in the world, what degrees you have acquired, or what possessions you have accumulated, you are still only 5% real. So you may be building skyscrapers that boast your name across that skyscraper. And you may build golf courses all over the world. <laughs> but if you have only actualized 5% of that inner divinity, then you are only, you are still only 5% real. One who is committed to the path of illumination or chilaship is not concerned with people thinking that their life is odd. They just stay their course and focus on their spiritual labor. Maintaining the status quo is not their goal. The person does not doubt their path or their purpose or their existence of the higher realms. They never stop their forward momentum because they know that perfection does not lie in contentment. The one who approaches a spiritual life to find refuge from their problems or to make themselves strong and wealthy and powerful will find that they are not yet ready for the path of the light bearer. But those who are willing to strive to perfect themselves will engage in what? Service, absolutely, service. And spiritual disciplines. They will not falter as the difficulties of each day presents themselves, but will fearlessly plow ahead, grateful for the fiery tests that transform them. It is the light of the path which pulls the chela out of darkness. As their light expands, they become a magnetic, attracting force. So what that is telling us is, yeah, it's possible to uh, walk through the shadow of the valley of death, darkness, but the light pulls the chela out of the darkness.
So if you find yourself for a period of time or a cycle of falling into or being immersed or uh, feeling as if you are in total darkness, it's temporary because the light will pull you out. See, what is that light? It can be a light bearer. It can be a situation uh, that challenges you, that brings that light back out. Uh, and if you're worthy of it, it can be a master that sees that little formation, that little statue of yourself in the caves and says, ah, in trouble. Charge you with light and you come out of the darkness. Jailership is about striving upward in a spiral fashion. However, if you are living a life in parallel movement, a movement that is singularly parallel, it will keep you moving back and forth, back and forth on the same level. When this happens, such a person is ordinary. They have not yet responded to their inner call of that divine nature, and they just live an ordinary life. They're living, but it's ordinary. But those who hear the call and respond, the parallel movement changes into a spiral course. Striving in beauty on the path of light will take you to the goal. Striving in beauty on the path of light will take you to the goal. <clears throat> if you want to understand more about beauty, read some of the books by Nicholas Rourke. The movement, however, should not be rushed or artificially induced, or it will push you to the top without a real foundation. I'm going to reread this because it's so important. Your movement, your striving should not be rushed or artificially induced. If it is, you're going to find yourself at the top without a real foundation. And your tower will fall. So in each upward striving, there is free will, but there's also protection from above. So take your time. You know, the master says, make haste slowly, right? And this is why. So the door of discipleship is to separate yourself from your ordinary self and make you act as or live as a living soul. When you concentrate on the teaching, you will feel a change in you. You are above your personality. You have a little more power over your personality. If you create such an attitude, you will enter the power of discipleship. Real concentration is the ability to take your light of knowledge, learning, and information, and use it for livingness. See, it's not to become a millionaire. It's not taking the knowledge of others to make you a millionaire. It's like you take the light of knowledge, the light of the teaching, and you begin to learn from that light, gain information, and then upgrade it from your own experiences. And these experiences are called livingness. So you're not riding on the successes and knowledge of others. You're taking their success, taking their knowledge, putting it in your life, and you learn a lot more than what the surface provided. 
when you are hearing lectures and reading various books, the information only accumulates around the outside layer of your aura. When your knowledge through livingness accumulates enough, I'm sorry, that's not right. Sorry, just got ahead of myself. So sorry. When your knowledge accumulates enough, it builds that shell. See, this is the person that says, look at I have read 150 books and now I am really bright. That's the moment when we have this shell around us and we spiritually die from suffocation under the weight of this unused information. Our knowledge then leads us to death because it does not help in the process of our transformation. This is not particularly important to hear if you are a Ray to or love wisdom person because you are going to love your books. I can attest to that. I have three million books in my house and a little chair to read them all by. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm always hungry to read. Now those books just sit and I'm out doing. That's livingness. If I hadn't have read them, I don't know what would have happened. But, because I don't believe in what ifs, I don't live with what ifs, you know, it's like, this is what I learned, this is what I studied, I went through a recapitulation period, and now I'm taking all that recap back out into my life, putting it into my life, so that I didn't die under suffocation by being buried in the knowledge of those books. A light bearer brings fundamental changes into the world by way of their own transformation. Transformation is a stage of beingness in which you have changed your consciousness. If you do not change yourself, your physical etheric body, your emotional body, your mental bodies, then your knowledge is going to keep you moving back and forth see, on the same level, strengthening, increasing your vanity and ego, your glamours and your illusions, which prevent you from striving upward in that spiral fashion. We must bring our knowledge into action. When your waking consciousness is filled with higher ideas, what happens then is that your mind starts to actualize these ideas into your life. Concentration is a pump that injects the gas into the carburetor of your mechanism and enables you to move forward. When you are listening to one thing, and thinking of something else, you know, some people call it multitasking. Okay. <laughs> when you are listening to one thing and thinking of something else, you are in a semi-hypnotic condition, which is a very bad mental state. And this is something you want to watch with yourself and your children. When you have something over here going on, you have people over here talking, you might be in um, a classroom where a teacher is talking, and what do you have? You have your iPad. Or you have your cell phone. Let's say that's a cell phone. And you're so busy reading and texting and so forth. You know, this is what's happening to people today. You have no pump. Nothing is pumping psychic energy into you, and what's happening, you're moving into what the teachings call a semi-hypnotic condition, condition, which is a very bad mental state. The bad mental state. A light bearer strives not to allow this to happen. 
The average person collects knowledge, puts it into his pocket, and sleeps. The light bearer, on the other hand, acts. Their action is to contact light, to assimilate the light, and to produce action. So for example, let's say you have read many pages from the teaching on the subject of joy. By concentrating on joy and striving to bring joy, you're bringing it into your physical, emotional, and mental bodies. You're going to focus your mind, your every action, feeling, and thought upon the idea of joy. Striving for it through these faculties will help you manifest joy. I've mentioned this recently that we used to have classes that studied this text about joy and healing. And one of the exercises was to remember when you were young some of those joyful moments. And some people could not do that. And we learned the reason is because oftentimes joy becomes encapsulated. And our job is to unencapsulate it, <laughs> release it. And so it was, it's, it was almost shocking to go through, uh, at least it was for myself. I remember at a moment when I was at the university and a special, it was a special moment of accomplishment. And I ran for three miles to get back to the sorority house to tell my sorority sisters, look what I did. And when I walked into the house, there was turmoil because someone had failed a class which was throwing them out of the college, the university. And I went from, I want to share this wonderful experience to, oh my god, I can't say a word. Nobody cares, you know. That was an encapsulated moment. So a light bearer came along gave us a book called The Joy of Healing. Yeah, oh, that's what happened. So you go back and relive those encapsulated moments, release them, and pull that joy into all three of our bodies, and it heals us. So let me close. Chilaship is an opportunity. In every life, an opportunity is given to you to be a light bearer. It is like a boat that periodically comes to your shore at the most unexpected time. You open the curtain and look outside to the shore and you see the boat of Chila ship. You say, let me take off my pajamas, get dressed nicely, have something to eat, and then I'm saying goodbye, and so on. But when you go to the seashore, you see that the boat has already departed. See, you were so busy, in fact, you were so busy, well, should I, should I not, what does this mean? I may have to move, I'm going to have to change my whole life, that's changing your PJs into, you know. And so you've been so busy, busy, you know, going back and forth that by the time you got to the seashore, the boat was gone. Your opportunity was gone. So we are going to board the boat of Chile ship at the right time, with the right preparation, so that in our rush we do not leave our hat behind. Sometimes this change gets lost for 50 years or 50 lifetimes, this chance gets lost for 50 years or 50 lives, and then it comes again. What form does the boat take? Sometimes it is a man or a woman, a group, an opportunity to make you strive to a higher level of consciousness. These, op kind of, these kinds of opportunities or the boat. If you catch these opportunities and adore them and really dedicate your life, you're going to catch the boat. Isn't that great? 
So now you know what a light bearer is, what a chila is, and what a disciple is. I've enjoyed sharing this morning. It would, you can imagine putting a talk together like this. You know, and, and it was short. You know, it's like I'm going to run out of time. I mean, no, I didn't mean that. I'm going to have so much time left. <laughs> what are we going to do? So I talked about, you know, the New York Times article and the elves, and, and now I'm out of time. So <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening.